Dear Father in heaven, I just want to ask you this morning to translate my words according to the needs of every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to start reading in verse 22. We're going to study this story together when Jesus walked on water. But um, just to, to give you a bit of a background of, about what happened before, right before this episode, Jesus had been speaking to a large multitude. And um, what he had to say, I mean, that sermon was so interesting that uh, the majority of the people forgot to even sit down. When Jesus was about to feed them, he had to ask them to sit down on the grass. So he fed about 5,000 men, not including women and children. A large multitude were fed on that day. Now, if you look at verse 22, Matthew 14, 22, <clears throat> it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Why did Jesus have to command his disciples to get into the boat and go to the other side of the lake. And um, for that, let's read John 6, verse 15. Because I'm glad that we have four versions of everything that happened with Jesus. John 6, verse 15, speaking about the same event. John says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force, to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. In other words, this multitude, including his disciples, had misunderstood Jesus' mission on earth. They were expecting Jesus to become an earthly king, to free them from the Romans, to make them become the greatest nation in the world. But Jesus had different plans. Now, Jesus was sad because he had been with them about three years already. And his disciples had not yet understood his mission on earth. So, in other words, Jesus had a problem. He was frustrated. And what did he do when he was confronted by this problem? Let's read now. Matthew 14, verse 23. And it says, And when he had sent the multitudes away... He went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. What did Jesus do when he had a problem? He prayed. For Jesus, prayer was his first option, his first resort, not the last. But oftentimes, prayer for us is the last resort. When we have a problem... We try many different things. We go to the bank. We ask for help. For, um, for about, uh, if it's about money, we ask money from friends. Or we go to the bank. Or we go to the doctor. We try to solve it. And when we've tried everything that we can think of, then we go like, oh, I guess all I can do is pray. For us, prayer sometimes is the last resort. But for Jesus, it was the first and most important one. If he needed to pray like that, how much more do we need to pray? Whenever we have a problem, then we should bring it before God in prayer. And he really prayed. He prayed until it was dark. He was there all night, almost all night, by himself. So interesting. Okay, let's continue reading the story. Verse 24. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And we know that there was a storm, right? Now let me ask you, who sent the disciples on the boat to go across the lake? Jesus. Do you think he knew that there was going to be a storm? Yes, yes he did. Then why did he send them? Test. To test him, right? Now we have a lesson here. Every time that God asks you to do something, don't expect things to be easy. You may be facing difficulties. 
when you are doing God's will. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy, but he has promised that he will be with us. Now, the disciples were there. They obeyed what Jesus said, and yet they were confronted by this storm in the lake. They were tossed by the waves. The wind was contrary. Now, let's ask the other Gospels what they have to say about this particular part of the story. Let's go to John chapter 6, please. John chapter 6 and verses 16 to 19. <clears throat> John 6, 16 to 19. In the words of John, it sa he says, Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was already dark. And Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. It was dark. They were in the middle of the sea, about three to four miles away from the shore. Okay, let me ask you. Have you been to the beach when it's completely dark? Clouded sky, no moon, no stars, it's pitch dark. Can you see anything? Is it nice to walk towards the waves? Because you can hear them. Maybe you can see the foam, but it's a bit scary. And you can't see very far, right? It was really dark, and the boat was about three to four miles away from the shore. Now, let's ask Mark what he has to say about this. Mark chapter 6, verses 47 to 48. Mark 6, 47 and 48. Well, at least the beginning of 48. Mark 6, 47 says, Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea. Now we know that it was about three to four miles away from the shore. And he, Jesus, was alone on the land. Where was the boat again? In the middle of the sea, about four... Miles away from the shore, it was dark. And where was Jesus? On the shore. Don't forget that. Now let's read the following. Verse 48. Then Jesus saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. He saw them. But where was Jesus? On the shore. How far away from the boat? Four miles. It was dark. I mean, can you see anything from the shore? No, yet he saw them. Another lesson, right? You may think that while you're going through a difficult time that no one knows about it, you may think that God is not watching you. When you go and lock yourself in your room and you're crying and no one seems to care, believe me, Jesus is watching you because he cares even about the smallest details in your life. When the disciples were straining and rowing in the middle of the sea, Jesus was on the shore, four miles away in the dark, but he, yet he was watching them. He was taking care of them, although he was not with them yet. And, and we will see why he was not with them as we continue. Isn't that amazing? He can be always with you. Don't forget that. I don't know what difficulties you're going through, but um, you may be sure that he's watching you. He's looking after you. And he may show up. Maybe the fourth watch, maybe the first watch. It depends on you, not on him. But we'll see why. Okay, that was verse 24. Verse 25. We're, in, we're back in Matthew 14, verse 25. It says, now in the fourth watch of the night. This is between 3 to 6 a.m. I mean, after, a, after long, a few long hours, after the disciples were straying at rowing, Jesus showed up at about 4 or 5 or maybe 6 a.m. 
Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. Hmm. Walking on the sea. Why do you think Jesus waited so long to help them? He was watching them. <laughs> they were about to die, about to drown, and Jesus just waits on the shore. And I believe he does the same thing with us. Because like I said at the beginning, every time we were faced with difficulties, we try to fix it our own, ourselves. We do everything we can, and then we realize that we can do nothing. And then we ask God for help. And I believe that the disciples were trying because they, they thought they were experts, right? They were, they were trying to save themselves from these waves. They forgot about Jesus. I mean, what can Jesus know about, you know, boats and waves? And I mean, we're the experts. So when they realized that they could do nothing, and that took a few hours for, for them to realize that, then they may have said, ah, oh, where's Jesus? Last resort, you see? That's when Jesus was able to show up. He was waiting for them to realize that, uh, hey, you can do nothing without me. When we are facing temptations, what do we do? Do we fight against them on ourselves? Or do we go to Jesus as our first option? Think about that. He may be waiting for you to realize that you need him. And then he will show up. But he's looking after you. He's looking. He's watching. All right. The Bible says that Jesus came to them walking. It amazes me. He was just walking. I mean, what was the biggest problem for the disciples right then? Wasn't that the waves, the storm, the waves? Now, Jesus comes walking on top of the biggest problem. Because for him, is nothing. Reminds me of the story of Daniel 3.25 where it says that in the, in, inside the, the, the fiery furnace, Jesus was there, was there as well, walking in the fire. The fire was the biggest problem for these three young uh, Hebrews, but he was, yet, he was just walking. For him is nothing. So he comes walking on the sea, right? He shows up when they realized that they could do nothing. And verse 26 says, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they, cry, they cried out for fear. Hmm. It is interesting how we react sometimes, right? It's interesting to know that um, whatever the problem is that we're facing, for Jesus is nothing. If it is fighting against a sinful habit, for him is nothing. He can help you. Don't do it alone. Sometimes our biggest problem is, is not the waves or the fire. Sometimes our biggest enemy or problem is our character. We cannot overcome our, our characters. Maybe we cannot forgive someone. We're holding grudges all the time. We find it really difficult to forgive. And one of the things that were, was mentioned at this, the Wellness Center is that when you don't forgive, you're hurting yourself. You're not, you're not allowing yourself to heal. God is able to produce in you the desire to forgive. I remember uh, some years ago I was invited to run an evangelistic campaign in, here in, in the U.S., in Maryland. I won't mention the church, but um, every night after the presentation, I would ask people to, to give up their lives to Jesus Christ. So people were standing up every night, but I noticed every night there was a man sitting in the second row, second or third row, row on my left. And he, all the time he looked at me with, I don't know, I couldn't read his facial expressions. I, I think he was angry. I was even thinking, am I saying something? Am I offending him, maybe? He was, like, anxious or angry, especially when I was doing the altar call. He was, like, fighting with something or maybe angry at me. I didn't know that. On the last night, I, again, made an invitation to give your life to Jesus. 
And for the first time, this man stands up. After struggling a bit, I was just praising the Lord. I didn't know what, what he was going through, but he stood up. Then um, there was a big hole uh, besides or next to the, the church. And as I was shaking hands with the people as they were leaving, I noticed that diagonally across the hall, this man was standing. And he was watching, looking at me with this angry face. At least that's what I thought. And when I finished greeting everyone, he started walking towards me with a steady pace. And I was just thinking, what is he going to do to me? Where are the deacons here? You know, <laughs> and no one's going to help me. He comes to me and he said, Pastor, you have no idea what I've been going through. And I said to him, yes, you're right. I have no idea. I've been trying to figure it out all the way, the, for, the whole week, for the whole week. And he said, three weeks ago, my only son, because he was a single dad, my only son, 19-year-old, he was murdered on the street. He was stabbed on the back five times, his throat was slit, and he was left on the streets to die. And then he, he hugged me, and he started crying like a baby. And I was speechless. I mean, what do you say to someone who tells you something like that? I mean, I couldn't find any words to comfort him. And as I was hugging him, I was praying in my mind, please, God, help me to to know what to do in this situation. And I just said to him, look, uh, I don't know what to tell you. And then the thought came to my mind, and I'm sure that I was, that was God. And I said to him, hey, but I know someone who understands you. God, his son was murdered as well. His son was killed. He understands you. And he said, yes, now I know, now I know. And then he said, but that's not all. I know who killed my son. And all I needed to do, and in fact, that was my plan, he said, I just needed to pick up the phone, make a phone call, and I could have organized for that man to be killed. I was going to do that. And someone invited me to these presentations. I came, and I was confronted with the truth, with the love of Jesus and His power. And I knew that I've, if I stood up, I would have to give up my plans to get revenge. That's why I was fighting every night. But finally, I surrendered to Jesus Christ, and I forgive. I decided to forgive. I am free from that feeling of hatred. So do you think you cannot forgive someone? If that man forgave, God made a miracle. Whatever it is that you're fighting with, present it to Jesus Christ. And he will be, give you the victory. Don't, don't try alone like the disciples did for so many hours until Jesus shows up. All right. So it says in verse 26, going back to the story, that when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were troubled, and, and they said, It's a ghost! And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not fear. And it's funny because many times when we ask God for a solution, and when He presents to us the solution, when that solution goes against our personal preferences, we say, it's a ghost. It must be a ghost because I don't like it. Because if I do what Jesus says, then I may lose my job. If I do what Jesus says, then I may lose my, my relationship with someone. What are they going to think about me? Right? It's a ghost. It can't be Jesus. It's a ghost. You know, it doesn't matter... Many people hold on to material things like cars, houses, uh, positions, fame. But all of those things will not go to heaven. 
all of those things will, will perish. It doesn't matter what car you drive. You will not take it to heaven. <laughs> when I was a kid, every summer holiday, I, uh, we used, I used to play Monopoly with my two brothers. Because we had a long time to play, you know, summer holidays. And it took us days to finish that game of Monopoly. We came up with our own rules, of course, and I'm sure you did the same, because we couldn't bother to, look, uh, to read the instructions. But um, I remember that whenever I won, I spent a few minutes just contemplating that board, contemplating all the money that I had earned, all the greenhouses and all the red hotels and all my properties. I felt good, you know. And I, uh, I would have grabbed my mobile phone and took a picture of that board, but you know why I didn't? Because mobile phones did not exist back then. <laughs> I really liked to see that board because I was enjoying everything that I had made. But you know what? When the game was over, everything went back to the box. <laughs> you know, when the, when the game of life is over, Everything you have goes back to the box. So why do you care about that? When Jesus comes, everything will stay here. So whenever Jesus comes with a solution to your problem, and you kind of don't like that solution because it interferes with your lifestyle, don't worry about it. Just give it up and do what he says. Don't say it's a ghost, all right? Because it's Jesus showing up to help you. Verse 28 says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. See, it's always a good idea to make sure it is Jesus, the one who's speaking to you, and not yourself and not someone else. Make sure it is God speaking to you. through. Compare that thought with the Bible, because if it's a thought that goes against the Bible, then it doesn't come from Jesus, right? Make sure it is Jesus, like Peter did. If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, verse 29, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. He walked on water. Peter walked on water. I mean... I bet you that Peter never forgot about that experience until his last day on earth, right? Can you believe how it must feel to walk on water? Wow. So he did. He walked on water. It's interesting to notice that Jesus calls him, you know, he said, come. Then Peter steps out of the boat but the waves are still there. The wind's still blowing. Another lesson for us, right? When Jesus tells you to do something, don't expect everything to be easy. And as he walked on water, the waves were still there. But as he focused, as he fixed his eyes on Jesus, everything was fine. He was walking on water towards Jesus. And that's the key. Don't don't lose sight of Jesus. Verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Right now he realized I need Jesus because I'm sinking here. The moment he... He removed his eyes from Jesus and started to contemplate the enemies, the waves, the problems. He started sinking. How do we keep our eyes on Jesus? By having a relationship with him. Because you can't see Jesus right now. He's up in heaven. But through the Bible, you can have a relationship with him. It is so important. Otherwise, you won't be able to, to trust him. Right? How can you trust someone you don't know? 
Um, this is a story, a true story about a bus that was driving in one of those narrow roads of the Andes, narrow, dusty roads on the Andes. You had a wall of rocks on one side and the precipice on the other. And I have asked the, the friends at the back to, to show us a picture. You see that narrow road, dirt. So there were people traveling on a bus on that occasion, and they were not expecting this, but it started to rain. There was a storm. It got really dark. Thunders. People, the people inside the, the bus really started thinking that, oh, we're not going to make it to our destination this time. We're not going to make it. It was pitch dark. Driving like this far away from the precipice. And, um, yeah, everyone was um, very scared and crying. And um, all of a sudden, this lightning illuminates the bus for a few seconds. And this lady who was in the bus noticed that there was a boy sitting at the back by himself. And so she stood up and made her way to the back. She sat down next to the boy just to comfort him. And she asked him, oh, don't worry, I'm here. Are you afraid? And the boy said to her, actually, no, I'm not afraid. How come you're not afraid? Aren't you afraid of the storm? He said, no. Why? And the answer was, because the driver is my daddy. He had known his dad since he was born. He has spent time with him since he was born. Therefore, he knew him. Therefore, he was able to trust him. Because you can't trust someone you don't know. And you don't know someone unless you spend time with that person. That's why he trusted his dad. You can also trust a driver of your life. You can trust Jesus Christ if you spend time with him. That's the key. That's how you, you fix your eyes on Jesus. That's how you walk on water without sinking. If you keep a relationship with Jesus, there is no other way. A daily, personal relationship with Him. And that's what um, Peter forgot. Instead of keeping eye contact, that relationship with Jesus, he started focusing on the waves, on the temptations, on the financial problems, on your health on anything that is against you, rather than investing time with Jesus every day. And so he started sinking. Lord, save me. Verse, thir verse 31 says, And immediately, see, when you realize that you need Jesus, He comes immediately. He doesn't wait until the fourth watch. He comes immediately. And immediately Jesus stretched out His hand and caught Him. And said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? We often think, we oftentimes think about Peter as the one of little faith. But let me ask you a question. What requires more faith? To step out of that boat in the middle of the storm? Or to remain inside the boat with the other 11 disciples? I believe that Peter had a lot of faith to step down of that boat, to leave his comfort zone just because Jesus said, come. And he did. But in the process, he forgot about Jesus. And he started looking at the problems. That's the key to success in the Christian life. To have a daily relationship with Jesus. Daily. Just to get to know Him. Spend time with Him. Someone said to me that the Red Indians had a saying that it, that it goes like this. If you really want to get to know someone, you need to eat a bag of salt together with that person. How much time is it going to take you to eat that bag of salt? A long time, yes. That means you have, you have to spend time with that person if you, if you really want to know him. How can you say, I trust Jesus, if you never spend time with him? 
And the Bible says in Psalms uh, 125 verse 1 that those who trust in the Lord cannot be moved. Don't try alone. Then. Make the resolution today to spend time with Jesus daily. Let me finish with the last verse here. Verse 33. Then those who were in the boat, sorry, verse 32, I didn't read that one. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Peter left his boat to come to Jesus. What is your boat? Maybe your boat is a nice job, a good salary. A good profession, a nice relationship, a nice house, a good position. Sometimes, God will require you to step out of your boat and to depend on Him rather than on your bank account. And it may be that after a while you will go back to the boat but with Him. And when you go back to the boat with Him, the storm will cease. You know, sometimes life needs to get messy before it can be healed. But here you have a story that started with fear, ending with peace. If you want this story to be yours, then start spending time with Jesus daily and personally. And you will be able to overcome anything. Don't do it alone. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you because in your word you say to us daily that without you we can do nothing. Thank you for the power that you bestow on us every day as we spend time with you. Without you, all that we can do is fake it. We can fake being good Christians. Everybody may be deceived. But only you are able to transform us from within. So that all the good things that we do are just a result of a transformation. And not just outward appearance we pray for a true conversion and transformation we pray that no one here will neglect their relationship with you daily help us Lord to step out of our boats if we have to please Lord help us to allow you to be our Lord and Savior we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.